Welcome back. It has been a little while since we uh, bent the bar, bar liners and everything. That seems to have worked really well. We didn't get them perfectly straight because you add a bend and it creates more bend, but they are plenty straight enough now for the bar to slide through and we're having great results and it's actually pulling bar and things are good. I also thickened up the little tabby thing at the front that helps pull the next bar. So that's working really good. And then I've been making tons and tons of tweaks and improvements to the, the toolpath strategy. Um, those of you guys following me on Instagram, I've been posting a lot of stories. So make sure to check those out too. Tweaks to the, the way the tool goes in and the, the material left and the way it loads up. And I've broken a lot of end mills trying to figure this out. Um, but that's the cost of progress and it's fine. And then uh, things are going really well. We're making number 47, I think right now. And I just made three in a row and they're going great. Zero problems whatsoever. A couple little more safety checks that I want to add in place. Um, pull sensing, they're called cutoff detection on the lathe. And uh, that way it knows if the part has actually pulled off, it kind of just does this little and it measures all the load and everything. And that is working super duper good. So we're finally making clips. I just did another tweak to the pull sensing. I'm gonna post it to the machine and uh, make some more. So, in the lathe, let me show you some of the setup we have for, um, for making this. So I'll rotate the turret. So we have this guy right here, which is a 5 16 four fluid Lakeshore carbide end mill. Um, notice how it's sticking so far out of the tool holder because when it comes down here and starts machining, this collet nut has to clear the um, spindle. So it's pretty rigid, but it kind of chatters and kind of vibrates a little bit. And I was wondering if I got a tool, if I found a tool or got one custom made that was like a half inch shank and then it necks down and then you have the um, 5 16 end mill down at the bottom. Your shank, like all the extra room where I just need clearance is bigger and less vibrating. And then your, your actual cutting portion is only smaller and it's smaller diameter. It should be a lot more rigid. Um, more importantly, but on the same tool, this guy right here, huh? Same thing going on here. I've got a Technics collet extension right there with their slim fit collets. Pretty sweet system, I really like it. Um, one eighth inch ball mill with a half inch length of cut. This does all of the surfacing on the inside, all the profiling and, and 3D machining. So not only is the end mill pretty long, it's sticking out of the slim fit by a little bit and then the slim fit's sticking out longer. So I was wondering if I could get um, a neck down holder of that as well. So I can get like a 316 shank and then just get more rigidity down closer to the tool. And then the flute length is the only skinny part because I've broken probably three of these just in the past few days. And uh, it breaks at the collet, like fully at the top, not at the flutes. So making the top part stronger could can only help. Um, but it might be a really expensive tool to get that to work. So. Always thinking of these little ways to improve the process, improve the cycle, um, improve the reliability, because if that tool breaks, it causes problems downstream, and that sucks. But yeah, clips are going pretty good, so we've got, uh, check out in there, we've got our little simple green solution. Helps get the coolant off and stuff before we rinse them in the hot sink water. But yeah, they're looking super nice. Everyone is serial number engraved and the uh, serial number automatically counts up after every part. So I see 43 on that one and I see 46 on that one. So the other two are the other ones. But yeah, tolerances are holding really well and the parts look really good. The surface finishes look great. Super happy. And you can see the little tab in the front that is left on. It just needs that. Um, and then we'll grind that off by hand and then the parts go through a little bit of uh, buffling, buffing and polishing and then tumbling. And then they turn into a lovely Saga clip like this. Ta -da! One change that I just made on the previous clip, I'll have to inspect it actually, is I moved the logo 0.3 degrees to the left 
um, because I thought it was slightly off center. So I wanted just a little bit of move it over on the outside of the radius there. Uh, this is an older one, so I'm not sure if this one's bang on or not. It's very subjective. You're looking at it, you're going like, okay, I think it's a little bit off. I think I need to move it a little bit over. Um, so yeah, we want to make the most beautiful parts ever. So that's what we're working on. That's what I'm up to today. All right, here we go. We're going to run apart. Um, I'll show you on the control here. The key defines between manual operation and automatic, like running a program. So I had it in manual so that I can, you know, jog things around. I've got it in the B-axis right now. If you look in there, the B-axis moves when I rotate the thing. I can move it to the Z-axis, which moves the head, the big turret. I can move it to X, which moves the, the whole thing down. And then I can reference them and get them all back to happiness. So when running a program, I've always got to go key into the automatic position and then hit the memory button to actually run the program or memory restart if you want to make again and again and again and again. Um, just not ready for that yet on this part, like I was saying. And then reset, rewind, just kind of like starts it over again. Um, I always like to hold the rapid override knob. Like this is my kind of safety. I'm either holding the e-stop or the feed rate and like the classic machinist stance is to like go like this and just watch all the parts happening. Um, so I do that a lot. But let's get her going. So these tools, I've got coolant flowing through the tool directly to the insert, which is super cool. Doing a facing cut right now. Light turning with a roughing insert. Visibility is getting worse, isn't it? Spot drill. Big drill, through coolant drill. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna open the door, keep filming, check this out. Probe goes in there and says, is there a hole? And it says, yes, there is a hole. If there wasn't a hole, that means the drill bit broke and then uh, it would alarm out, which is good because you don't wanna break all the rest of your tools. So in that quick little just turning, facing, drilling, you can see the visibility on the window just went for garbage. And it gets even worse when doing all the milling. I'll show you a bit later. So in, I'll post little videos of how bad the visibility is on Instagram. And then a few people have said, get ceramic coating on the inside of your window. Um, I've tried Rain-X or, I don't, know, I don't think I've tried it, but other people have tried it and they said it wears off really quick. Um, but if you've seen, you know, I'm sort of a car guy. Um, car people are painting, painting their cars with the ceramic coating and you know you dump a bucket of mud on it and it just rubs right off like it's not even there it's like a hydrophobic coating anyway people are saying put that on the inside of the window and the coolant cannot stick to it it just rolls right off so i found the cheapest bottle i could on amazon which is 15 bucks um, there's other ones for like 100 bucks but i just i want a proof of concept um, the instructions for this were absolutely horrendous like the english Convert, uh, translation is you can't even read it. It doesn't even make sense. It's like do it one day before summer and one day before winter at the same time. I don't know. Anyway, so it takes a couple days to cure it says. So this Friday I'm going to clean just a little section on the inside of the window. Like maybe in the corner. A little section there. Put this guy on. Let it dry over the weekend. Come back in and hopefully I will have a viewing spot to actually view from. Um, some of the machines have those Visiport windows with the spinning disc, uh, but on this machine it's got a wiper right here that actually wipes the blade, the window. Kind of works. Um, so the Visiport would not work. So I, I'm, I'm kind of excited for this. I really want to try it out. And uh, I've heard from lathe guys saying it lasts for a year and it's like amazing. So I want to try that. Anyway, let's keep going. So what we're doing right now that we couldn't film through the uh, this isn't so bad. I can actually see through this a little bit if I know what I'm looking at. But we've got our Kyocera boring bar coming into the hole, doing our critical internal tolerances there. Um, that is where you know some of the other Saga components go and click and fit together. Um, so the dimensions are pretty critical. And then the outside dimension is also super critical. So now the probe's going to come in. It, it did a rough turning with the boring bar. 
probe's gonna come in, measure the actual, like physical, this is exactly what happened, and then it's gonna slightly offset that tool in order to uh, make the finish pass absolutely perfect. And we're achieving tenths with this. It's going really, really well. Now it's back in with the finish tool, and uh, current cycle time is 22 and a half minutes which is an eternity for us because most of our parts are like two minute cycle, three minute cycle. So a 22 minute part is enormous. Yeah, at 22 minutes is absolutely the longest cycle we've ever had. Um, I can't even think of one part over 10 minutes before. Um, but it's also really cool and really neat and uh, I like it, I like it a lot. As some of you guys know, um, we've been kind of filming the process of the saga this is Saga Saturday, I don't know, 14 or something like that. Um, but yeah, for the past year, we've been kind of chronicling how we're making this. A couple weeks ago, like we used this lathe to make all of our screws, all of our pivots, stop pins, um, and the pen components as well, lots and lots of parts. So it's a juggling act between uh, making the knife stuff, which is critical to our operation, obviously, and then setting it up to fart around on clips for a very long time, because it takes me, you know, Sometimes I can only get an hour a day to play on it. Um, we've got so much other stuff to do, but we've been tracking our output of the lathe and we, we worked really hard. We got all of our screws, all of our pivots, everything inventoried um, so that we can have some time to play on the lathe. And we've had almost three weeks now just to finalize the pen clip. And of course it hasn't taken three weeks nonstop, but like I said, I can, might only get an hour a day on it sometimes. But I'm glad that today finally is the day where we're doing production. This is the, uh, we will sell this clip right now. Um, if I look at the macros, I think it's number 600. Yep. So this is going to engrave number 47 next. Um, and then it automatically will count up once that's successfully completed, it'll count that up to 48 and then 49 and then 50 and then 51. And the one I'm holding right now happens to be number 38 um, from a little bit ago. But yeah, the auto counting macro is sick. Pretty complicated uh, engraving macro for that, but that's what I like to do. So now, this is where it gets interesting. I'm gonna pause it. Coolant's off, everything's safe. Open the door. So the the B axis has come in, it has grabbed the ID of that part, it's now holding the end of the part, and that end mill is coming in, I paused it, it's coming in, it's going to start roughing out all of the material to make it look like a clip, because this is our finished part and our roughed part right there. There's a lot of material to remove, so that is the next step. All right, so I'm going to do uh, a machining titanium, so you don't want, really want to do it dry, but I'm gonna do it dry for you guys. Um, okay, slow it down, everything's good. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple passes here with no coolant on, and you can see what's going on. I picked up that bird's nest at the top of the tool. It tends to do that. I don't think it's a problem, really. You can see the chips flying towards the camera. Imagine if we had this with no window in the way and like perfect clarity. That'd be great. All right, I'm gonna turn the coolant on, but watch the window here. There you go, how's your visibility now? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so you can totally see what's going on. Literally in these little like spots right here, if I'm really good, I can like get an eyeball in there and actually see what's going on or stick my head in the bottom corner. Um, but this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> I have no idea what's going on in there right now. Not true, I totally know what's going on, but it is super nice to be able to see, to be able to see it. So that ceramic coating um, should be amazing. And maybe I shouldn't have gotten the cheapest one, but if it works, then you get the good one later. I, I don't know. All right, so in the background, we have the live tools um, doing a lot of 3D profiling, you hear all that noise, but I've been taking little clips for Instagram and I want to show you guys, you know, like side by side um, and I'll explain them. So in this clip right here, in this clip, uh, just like we showed through the window, the roughing end mill is coming in and uh, hogging out a lot of that material using a 2D adaptive toolpath. It takes about two, two and a half minutes, I think it is. 
and it sounds angry, but it works great. In the next clip, this one, um, that little eighth inch ball mill is doing a scallop tool path on the inside and up and over the ramp of the clip and uh, going back and forth, back and forth, leaving a really, really nice finish. And then later we go through and engrave it and say Grimm's Knives 2018 on the inside of that. And then in the next clip, see the C-axis is rotating and it's using that same eighth inch ball mill to do a scallop, uh, not a scallop, a 2D, 2D wrap tool path which gets us this little area right here where I'm scratching with my fingernail. All these horizontal lines and then where the engraving goes afterwards. So that is done basically by the ball comes in and then the material rotates around it and then it jumps up and skips and then does it again and does it again and again and again. Does that about 10 times over and over and over and it leaves a super sweet finish. And besides it looks cool. I mean, just look at that. It's like watching both the C-axis, they're synced together, uh, the sub is slaved to the main spindle, so that as the main spindle turns, the sub follows it exactly. Super cool stuff. Um, random picture of, I guess you'll just post the whole picture, but random picture of what the clip basically looks like once it has a full form. Starting to look like a clip now. And then this shot next. Here we've got the ball mill doing a 3D parallel tool path along the side of the clip. Left side first and then right side, it'll rotate. And that takes, that takes many minutes um, per side. It's probably what it's doing right now actually. Almost. Um, that just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and gives us that super sweet uh, little corner radiuses everywhere, gives it the full shape of the clip, makes it super nice and requires less finishing work afterwards. The nicer I can make that surface, then the less work we have to put into it later. And I think that's it. In conclusion, check out our new merch. Look at this. I brought one home for Leif, my son, and he's like, Dad, you got merch. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, Yo came up with this little Grimm's Bro fist bump. Uh, we'll have them up on the, on the website eventually. Not quite yet, but very soon. And we'll bring a ton of them to Blade Show. So we will see you guys there, hopefully. We'll have a bunch of knives to sell, a bunch of pens to sell, and super excited about that. So, thanks for watching another episode of Saga Saturday. We're making good progress. Now that we have clips, we have everything else we need. We have cases, you haven't seen those yet. Um, I think we have everything we need to sell pens. So it's just that final, like, get the website set up, get the process set up, take pictures, assemble them, make them nice, anodize them, you know, a little stuff at the end. Uh, but we're there. We're there. I'm super happy and I'm super excited. I want to make a boatload of pens because I know you guys want them. So thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.